everybody's got a story, you just have to listen. Well, I'm Joe Partavila, and this is Good Listen, and I don't know if it's because I'm getting older, but getting slightly obsessed with the idea of time and wasting time. You know that old adage, the days are getting longer, but the years are getting shorter? Well, today I think my guest might be slightly obsessed with time, too. His name is Oliver Berkman. He's a British author, columnist, and journalist who you might know is the author of 4,000 Weeks Time Management for Mortals, which is the self-help book built around the philosophy and psychology of time management and happiness. Well, we're going to get into our dysfunctional relationship with time and his latest book, Meditations for Mortals, Four Weeks to Embrace Your Limitations and Make Time for What Counts. Oliver, welcome to Good Listen. How are you? I'm doing very well. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing excellent. And so the reason I have you on the show today is for really selfish reasons. I have been on this high horse, this kick for the last two years about the busyness epidemic. The world is so busy. We're so busy. And I like to joke that the 90s were all about being tired. Oh, we're, we're tired all the time. And I think that's why Starbucks like exploded because everyone needed caffeine because everyone was tired. But now all of a sudden, everyone's busy. They're too busy to do this, too busy to do that. What happened to us? What? Why are we so freaking busy in 2024? Well, I think there are lots of different reasons, but but a couple of them, and they're all part of the same thing, are, you know, firstly, we live in this world of kind of infinite inputs, as I call it, right? So there's there's no limit to the number of emails you could receive, no the number of demands you could feel that or be, have made of you, the number of ambitions you might have, things you want to launch. Um and and so as our sort of technologies are, allow us to move through these things faster and faster, we get um, we get better and better at moving through these infinite supplies. But we don't get to the end of them because that's not how infinity works, right? So you 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 just get sort of more and more um, stressed and anxious, and your life fills up with more and more stuff. And you know if you get really good at answering emails, as everyone knows, the the reward for that is you just get loads more emails that you then have to get even better at at answering. Right. But at the same time, I think there is a kind of a social status attached to it, right? There's a there's a sort of unavoidable sense that, well, I'd rather be too busy than insufficiently busy, and uh, and 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 there's a kind of a payoff if you, if you're sort of pulled all over the place and feeling terribly overwhelmed. It's not nice. It's not fun, but uh, at least you matter in some in some sense, right? Yeah. And, and on a societal point, one of the things I, I often laughed about is the fact that busyness is seen as this sort of like shield and this and, and this status of like when so when you ask someone a question, hey, are you able to do this? And the person responds, I'm busy. It's this automatic like drop the gauntlet. You know, it's the record needle scratch. It's like, oh, this person's busy. I can't possibly bother this person because they are quote unquote busy. Yeah. As you can tell, I'm passionate about this, Oliver. <laughs> yeah, I think um, it, it has just become a sort of a catch-all, a catch-all phrase. And and the the real truth of it is just that you know we're finite humans, and the number of things we could do is infinite. So everyone's always really is. I mean, everyone's always completely busy on some level, right? And and yeah. that's the same as saying that nobody's busy. I mean, we, we all we can do in any moment is make the best choices about how to use the next hour and the next hour and the next hour and uh, let all the rest fall by the wayside. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting when there was like that fad a few years ago, Oliver, and I know you keep up with stuff like this, but like remember when the power of no, like take back your life by saying no. And I feel like that's almost permeated to almost like a sort of to have negative effects because all of a sudden it's like, if you say no to everything, you're never going to try something new or or experience something or take a risk. And so let's talk about that a little bit, about this like this whole it was it was actually kind of like this whole cottage industry of the power of no. There were books and podcasts all about it. But this idea of like saying no, but then sort of confining yourself from trying other things or or doing exp new experiences and something else new. I mean, I think I'm gonna sort of half agree with you and half disagree. I think that the, okay. the I think that the power of saying no and the power of saying yes are kind of completely intertwined with each other. And it's again for the same reasons that I'm sort of going on about here. We are always effectively saying no in any moment to a million things because that's the nature of making choices with time, right? If you're going to um, spend 
couple of hours catching up with a good friend, you're not spending that couple of hours getting on top of your email inbox. Um, and so the ability to sort of say no to the lure of email, for example, in that case, or to some other demand that you don't want to do is crucial to being able to spend the time with a friend. But you have to know what you want to say yes to. You have to be able to be doing both of these things. And yeah, when it comes to trying things that are new, um, I don't think that the real power of saying no is about a sort of a defense mechanism against the anxiety that is involved in in new things. That's the kind of thing to consider saying yes to. I think it really is that it's that sense of, well, in every moment we're saying no and saying yes. And the question is, are we going to do it consciously? Yeah, that was the point I was getting to, Oliver, was the fact that a lot of folks it's and I used to work and, and I'm sure you know people who work with them. It's like the no before yes people. Like before the even <laughs> the question is is actually out of your mouth. The person's already thinking no first. And I think that's the mindset I want people to break free from. Yeah, yes, say no what you want. You know, obviously we all have we talked about the finite amount of time, but the idea of like your automatic knee jerk is no. I think that's the cycle you people need to break just just for their own personal de development, right? Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. I think, I mean, we, the, 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 in, yeah, w w w there's, it's incredibly important to be willing to let things into your life that are not, um, uh, that are not familiar to you because otherwise there can be no novelty and nothing, no progress. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and let's talk about like your journey to, to becoming this sort of personal development guru. I know for years, self-help was was like the word and then all of a sudden i think someone stood up it's like i don't like the i don't like that <laughs> and i know some of your stuff says self-help but like this idea of of personal development and helping people become better people and and i always i often say oliver that we can't change but we can improve we're sort of like the, a human iphone like we can improve our software every few years by either education by interactions with other people so how did this journey start with you where you wanted to help people you know, on their personal growth path? I mean, to be honest, to this day, all I really feel like I'm doing is figuring stuff out for myself and sharing it as I go along. I I don't, I mean, I'm not offended by being a, a self-help guru or something, but, but I don't think of myself in any such terms because I think all I'm doing in my writing really is figuring out what seems most urgent to me, grappling with it and sort of passing on what I what I learned. So uh, really what I'm doing is a kind of very public form of therapy, really. Uh, what I'm always struck by is how helpful that seems to be for people, right? They're actually, I, and this is true for me as well, right? We don't want to hear from people who are claiming to be completely perfect at everything. That's just not, that's, it's, it's dishonest. Nobody believes it in the first place. If you actually say, you know, as I try to look, yeah, I, I know what it is to feel overwhelmed by stuff. And here's what I think is going on. Well, partly that's useful because you can sort of share some tips and tricks that have worked, but it's also useful just because there's something really empowering about being like, yeah, we are all in this boat today in the 21st century. It's, um, it's, uh, it's not just you <laughs> as it were. And I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of power in that. Did you, were you intentional with this? Like, was this something where you, or you stumbled onto this idea of, of being able to help people through your pain or through through the stuff that you suffered with was was it intentional or was it was it unintentional well it's sort of a mixture because i've always been a writer and that's the thing i do and i do it even when it's you know outside of my work i i i i make sense of things by um by writing about them whether in a journal or whether in sort of public uh forums and so what happens if you do that and you do it a lot is that you will just naturally start by the sort of you know law of large numbers or whatever start producing things that um sort of resonate with people in in different ways now i wouldn't say it was a really detailed plan to 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 do this but one of the amazing things about you know the digital economy and having an email newsletter and all of this stuff is just that you um you reach those people right if there's 10,000 people on the planet who share my, find my particular stuff useful, who share my sort of particular weird issues and benefit from what I've got to say about them, you're going to find them. Uh, it wasn't that way when I worked on a newspaper for many years. There you really have to appeal to like anybody who could be picking up that newspaper. But um, I think it's, 
you know, it's a sort of unfolding journey. But no, I, I any time I've made really detailed plans for my future, they've had borne no resemblance <laughs> to what to what ends up. That's awesome. You know, for, for many years, I, I worked in morning radio in New York City. And, you know, every day you would talk about like stuff that was in news, pop culture and everything like that. But and, and this is something that I stumble upon is like as much as you talk about stuff that people want to talk about, no one really connects with you until it's a personal thing. Like right. until you share a story about the, uh, you know, a run in you had at a store or a, something, a traffic incident. Um, it's funny how we all connect. And I know storytellers have, have this sort of been the idea of, from the caveman of sharing stories and people being entertained by it. But when did you realize that your words had an impact on people? Because when I, well, like I said, when I was doing the radio, like I figured, oh, people like me, people were listening because we saw ratings, but we didn't see the actual sort of like the soft tissue stuff yeah. until we started talking about our own personal life. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, I've, I've been writing for ages. I was sort of making little like amateur newsletters to force my schoolmates to read when I was a kid, you know, I've been doing this for ages, <laughs> but, but, um, there's a big difference. You know, I worked in sort of old media newspapers for a, for a long time and there you, you know, you definitely get feedback. You definitely get people responding, and it, and it resonates. But it's um, it it's much less sort of um direct, and most people don't feel moved to respond to any given column. And this half of this was like pre-internet anyway. The email newsletter is when I've really been able to understand that what it is that I'm writing that is helpful to people. Because then you just there's something strangely intimate about email. There kind of shouldn't be somehow. I don't understand it, but like. Once someone has said yes, you are allowed to, um, you know, send your email to my inbox. They, they're liable to sort of take it seriously and look at it. And that's when I've found that I've really sort of connected with people. I think that a lot of the world of productivity advice and self-help advice and all the rest of it, it's all ultimately to do with kind of maintaining this kind of fake facade that everyone's doing great, that everyone's happy, that everyone's on the path to the very next goal, and it's all brilliant. And if you just come along and say, actually, it's a little different than that, and it's not depressing, it's not about giving up, but it is about seeing the ways in which we're actually limited and the fact that we have to sort of lean into those limitations and the fact that you're not going to get to do everything, you're going to die with a really long to-do list because that's just what it means to be a human. As soon as you actually say that, a lot of people are like breathe a huge sigh of relief and are, are keen to read about it more and to talk about it more just because it's like, oh yeah, this is actually how it really is. How much did you see this wave turn of the emphatic leader, uh, you know, having empathy with the pandemic? One of the things I noticed with the pandemic is no one knew what empathy was until like a, a global, <laughs> a global <laughs> disease hit the world. Then all of a sudden, you're seeing these CEOs talking about being empathetic and feeling what the their employees are feeling. And so, how about that? Like the the idea that all of a sudden the word empathy just was like reborn in 2020. Uh, it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure some of it was real. Some of it. <laughs> um, uh, that was a big, that was a, that was a very big deal. And there was a lot of awful stuff going on, but um, uh, you know, I think that organizations for a long time have been looking for, you know, try to find the thing that will make people, uh, loyal to the organizations right and for a long time there was before that there was a long spell when there was a great focus on trying to make it sort of actively fun to be uh right in the workplace very few things more agonizing and unpleasant than organized fun um and uh and and i don't i think you know a lot of that uh, a lot of that didn't didn't really work um and empathy you know it's great if your boss is empathetic about your situation but it's probably greater if your boss gives you a pay rise you know it's like um yeah i think that um uh, what you're seeing in a lot of uh, a lot of the decisions that people make about their their work and changes they make to their careers and and stuff is that kind of realization that time is limited and at some point you'd better do something that that makes you feel alive rather than uh, just just sort of pleases other people. Yeah, and that sort of led to a lot of the work you've done recently. Uh, in 2021, you had the book Four Thousand Weeks: Time Management for Mortals, and that's going to lead us to our next book to your next book in a moment. But let's talk about time management. Uh, we, we sort of opened up this conversation talking about the fact that we're all busy and we just love being busy. Um, what are some of the reasons that led you to that? And why do you think we're so bad at time management? 
Well, when I wrote that book, I really wanted to sort of take seriously, like, okay, time management is this idea that feels a bit thin and a bit cheesy. It's just sort of like, you know, morning routines and daily schedules. But really, when you think about it, it's like the biggest question that there is in a human life. We've got this short amount of time. What, how are we going to be more conscious about choosing what to do with it? The short answer to why I think we're so bad at that is that we're not really, most of the time, trying to use the time that we have as wisely and as meaningfully as possible. We're actually trying to make ourselves feel like we don't have limited time. We're trying to sort of do some emotional, play some emotional trick on ourselves where, where we don't have to feel what it's like to be a human with limited time and tough choices to make about that time. So a lot of kind of optimization focused productivity stuff, efficiency stuff is all about doing more and more and more and more in the same amount of time. Supposedly, I guess, to get to some point where you're doing enough and then you can do everything and you never need to worry because you're you're efficient enough to do it all. But as we've discussed, that, that time is never coming. So I think it's all kind of like a fantasy that, you know, just to get completely sort of uh, deep and philosophical about it is ultimately about us not wanting to be mortal, not wanting to die, right? We sort of want to get more and more and more capacity for doing more and more and more things. And what I'm always saying is that will never lead you to peace of mind. It can be useful, sure, to learn how to do things faster. I'm not against it. The only thing that will really lead you to a feeling of like, now I'm managing my time well, is getting better at making those choices about what to do and what to neglect and being willing to not do things in order to do other things. Um, because if you're always you're just trying to do more and more, then there'll always be even more for you to try to do and it will never end. That treadmill will never end. And I don't want to spend the next few minutes shitting on technology, but let's shit on technology for a few <laughs> minutes. Uh, and that is the idea that, of the distractions. Uh, you know, you talked about, you know, earlier about the fact that, you know, we were always connected to our technology, whether it comes to, you know, responding to emails and such. But think about all the other distractions like YouTube. Someone may be watching this right now on YouTube and thank you for watching. But the problem is, there's so many people watching things as opposed to doing things. You know, there's always, Oliver, I'm sure you've seen these surveys of the human attention span is that of a goldfish. Well, if that's the case, why are people listening to three hour Joe Rogan podcasts or binge watching an eight episode Netflix series in one day? I mean, so is it just false attention? Is it where you, you sort of mentioned something there about like putting the, the, the spotlight on the wrong things and sucking away time that could be spent on doing something that was either worthwhile or something that's that's good for you, your friends and your family. I think there's a couple of things to be said about distraction here. So the first is that we live yet yeah, in a sort of an environment, an attention environment that is quite hostile to focusing on the things that you want to focus on. The whole world of social media and more is is designed to sort of harvest as much attention as possible. So obviously there is this phenomenon where Ultimately, you know, some social networks are better than others, but ultimately all of those kinds of platforms want to keep you on the site as long as possible. That's that's the goal, it's a totally straightforward business goal. And the result is that um, they prioritize the things that keep you there, which might well be things that make you furious or things that make you laugh, but are completely without substance and then make you feel like you just wasted an hour. And so you do have to sort of exercise some real personal you know, autonomy, if you're not just going to fall into that uh, whirlpool of distraction. But the other thing that I think doesn't get as enough attention is that we sort of go along with it, right? We, we, we distract ourselves from the inside as well as being sort of um, distracted from the outside. When, when I'm writing something and then I end up apparently frittering away half an hour on Twitter or whatever, it's not because I was loving the writing and then the social media network kind of grabbed me against my will. Obviously, I was getting kind of antsy. And then I thought, oh, it'd be more fun to do that. And and I think what that sort of points to is that a lot of the stuff that actually we love to have in our lives, you know, challenging work and deep relationships and all the rest of it, like it doesn't feel super great and comfortable, especially at first. And And there are lots of reasons why in the moment, we would prefer to go and like read about some completely pointless celebrity feud that's going to make no difference to our lives at all. So it's actually what's needed here, actually, to bring up another slightly cliched word, is a kind of mindfulness, right? It's kind of 
you sit down to do something that you want to do or you sit down to have a conversation with your spouse or you spend a few hours like paying attention to your your kids or whatever it is and you sort of expect that you learn to expect this is this is what i think is important to do you you learn to expect that there'll be some restlessness there there'll be some kind of like well i'd rather be distracting myself as soon as you see it you have a choice about whether to give in to it or not but if you don't see it you you'll find yourself like yeah two hours later scrolling through instagram with with nothing to show for it it's and it's funny too i know the argument is always but it's a generational thing like gen z and gen alpha they're attached to their screens but funny enough Oliver, my wife and i were in a diner yesterday and sitting across from us is an elderly couple probably yep. 80 plus so the greatest generation i think that is that's, that's over boomer right. um and they're both on their phones both on right. their phones so right. it, it, it's as much as the younger generations were born with the phone in their hand the older generations have grown to be like yeah, this, I like the I like the I like this stuff. I like these like endorphins I'm getting and the and these the, the, the oxy the oxy, all all that crap that your mental juices flow when you're when you're on social media. So it is funny how we are so quick to blame like the younger generation. But man, it don't matter how old you are, you can get hooked on this stuff. Oh, totally. There's I mean, there's a famous um, technology critic called Tristan Harris who says that every time you open up a social media network, uh, a social media app, there are a thousand people on the other side of the screen, paid good san francisco salaries to try to keep you there right this is not a fair fight um and so it, it that you know you really do have to put quite a bit of effort into um looking after your attention um i think it, you know it's just, it, it get, only gets more and more important and we don't actually even help the rest of the world right like many people who are more sort of pro-socially minded um end up getting distracted all day long reading about politics or reading about war and suffering around the world. They have good motives a lot of the time, but that's not actually a way to help those issues. That's just a total, just as much distraction as if it was celebrity news, really. Right. Um, and so that brings us to your latest book, Meditations for Mortals. Um, I was getting a very much, because as I'm a middle-aged white guy, Oliver, so I'm all about stoicism these days. So I was, I'm, I'm getting a very sort of stoic kind of through line through this about, you know, you know, one thing I always pull from stoicism, you control what you control. Don't, you know, other, other people can't control how you feel, that kind of thing. How, how does philosophy, has philosophy your, your current philosophy play into what Meditations for Mortals is? Well, I think Stoicism is definitely present in the book. I think Zen Buddhism is probably the other main influence. What I wanted to do in this book was to really dive into this question of why it's so easy to sort of know what you want to be doing with your time and how you want to be showing up for life and then just like not to do it, not to actually do it. And so it's a book about crossing that gap, I think, from knowing to, to doing, but it's also meant to like have that effect right so i didn't want it to just be another system for people to read about and put on a shelf and, and forget about so it's it's this sort of four week structure divided into seven short chapters for each week and you know i certainly can't force anyone to read one a day but that's kind of the the idea and and what i'm trying to do i think is to sort of explore these ideas and help shift people's perspective in in favor of sort of taking meaningful action but right in the middle of their existing lives, right? So this is something that can just fold into the fact that you've got too many emails and a million projects on the go and three kids who need your attention. It's not about like, well, when I get weeks of time off, then I will finally turn my attention to this. So I'm trying to sort of undermine deliberately what I think is a problem with a lot of self-help, which is even if it's really good, it, 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 it's something that one ends up reading about instead of, actually implementing yeah i think my problem with a lot of personal development books out there is it's too much yeah uh, and sometimes you'll read a, a, this amazing work whether it's something like the tools or something like that yeah. and be like man that was great i feel like a better person but blank i don't i don't remember any of it right for me oliver i can't ever like retain all of this stuff so in a way you're you're helping the people like me who are like Man, I'm not. I'm never gonna. I'm, as I actors say, like I'm not gonna be off book. I'm not gonna memorize this book. So the idea of of you putting in these little sort of little nuggets 
is sort of helpful, I think, right? I, I hope so. And, you know, that's really part of it is that it's like it's not to be retained. It's to be if you do say you do decide to read this book at that approximately at that rate of sort of a chapter a day, a little chapter, the five minutes with your coffee or something. If there's something in that little chapter that resonates, it'll stick. It'll stick anyway. You don't need to like be writing it down and taking notes. And then it'll might maybe, you know, maybe it'll change how you go through that day, just a tiny little bit. I think there's all sorts of potential for a more effective kind of personal change that comes from just like, yeah, just letting a book sort of uh sort of uh yeah, wash over you and, and see which bits naturally hang about. And, and you know, the title Meditations for Mortals, it is funny how, you know, as much as we like to say the world's gone to hell in a handbasket, I mean, the world's pretty good. And the fact that, like the term meditation, I remember growing up, again, card carrying Gen Xer, the idea of someone meditating was like, look at this weirdo. What are they doing meditating? And now we've gotten to the point where meditation is, I mean, even healthcare and 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 the and the and the and the doctors say meditation is good for you so it, it the evolution of man is is a constant and meditate meditating is, is a big part of it how do you for someone who like maybe and again it's not about meditation per se but like the idea of having that daily practice of quietness and stillness do you embrace that do you try that any any tips for that because i think you know we've this whole conversation has been talk we've been talking about busyness and distractions but how do we find stillness? Yeah, I mean, as you say, it's not a book about meditation in the sense of sitting on a cushion and following your breath, although definitely the discussion in there of how to cultivate habits and things could definitely apply to that um, to, to that practice. I think the thing that I want to say about that, that idea about finding finding stillness and really about building any kind of habit for greater consciousness, for greater sort of... Um, uh, presence in the present moment, anything else, is that we we get too caught up in this idea of trying to kind of find the perfect schedule for it. We get too caught up in the idea of like, what's the ideal routine? Now I'm going to put this into practice every day for the rest of my life. I think there's an incredible benefit in learning, if you can, to sort of just let yourself do the thing once, right? So if, if it is meditating that you have wondered about, or if it is writing in a journal, or if it is taking a short walk each day or something, it's not about launching this whole new project where you're going to do it every day for the rest of your life, or even for 30 days, although that is a more manageable goal. It's just literally doing it once today, like just today. Uh, however imperfectly, however sort of falteringly, with no confidence that you'll necessarily ever come back and do it again, right? But just nonetheless being willing to do it. Because otherwise, and I found this from personal experience, actually trying to develop the good habits can become a, a weird kind of psychological barrier from doing those things because you you tell yourself that you're involved in this whole complicated thing where you're going to like add these habits to your life and then three days in it's all too much and you can't be bothered and you fall off the wagon and then you never get back on if you if there's something that you want to be doing more of in your life i think it is so powerful to be able to just like do it once and then maybe tomorrow and maybe the next day sure and then you've got to practice and you're golden but like to just start from that perspective of can i allow myself to just do this thing hmm. and and speaking of uh, setting rules for yourself uh i'm a big fan of the golden rule but you write about the rule of saint benedict uh tell, tell me about that for the folks who, who are unfamiliar with yeah well this was i mean the rule of saint benedict is a is is the way in which um, lots and lots of monasteries and convents still organize their their days today. It's like a rule book, really, of um, how to structure and run a religious community. But what's interesting about it to me, uh, I'm not really religious, so it's not that, but it's that it's that it's got this very, very interesting approach to being flexible, right? Because actually in the history of this, St. Benedict was this monk who sort of was outraged by all the moral depravity he saw around him. So he set up all these kind of very strict monasteries where people had to follow incredibly rigid rules. And um, uh, on two different occasions in his life, uh, he was the victim of a poisoning attempt by monks who he was um, in authority over because they sort of hated the rigidity of the, um, of the rules that he was imposing on them. So then he wrote this thing called the rules that has become known as the rule of St. Benedict. And it's totally different. It's like it's it's this incredibly kind of um, forgiving and and um, 
uh, flexible approach, which sort of says, look, we're dealing with humans here and we'd like to get them to do certain things, uh, but we better accept that we're dealing with humans. And there's a very f actually funny passage in it, which about regulating the consumption of alcohol in monasteries, which says basically, I'm paraphrasing, but it says basically, ideally, monks would never drink beer. But apparently these days, and he's talking about like the so many centuries ago um apparently these days you can't get monks to stop drinking so at least drink in moderation and don't get intoxicated right and it's it's hilarious in this ancient document to see this guy saying basically like look we're not perfect it will be good not to have too much alcohol but um we've tried to get them to drink no alcohol and it doesn't work so let's just leave that aside and i think what's so interesting about this and what relevant to the to the sort of space of self-help and personal development is this rule has endured, this set of rules has endured for centuries. And I think what that tells you is that flexible rules that are not super rigid are far, far better and more sustainable, right? So for example, there's one I have in there about doing things daily-ish, right? If you tell yourself you've absolutely got to, I don't know, go for a run every single day, and that's your new plan, it's terrible when the first time you miss that because you're feeling sick or you just can't be bothered, like, then it's over or you're incredibly depressed and feel like a loser. If you tell yourself you're going to do it daily-ish or another rule that people are fond of these days, you know, to never miss two days in a row, for example, like you've got this kind of, there's this kind of, there's this give in the system, this slack in the system. And it it's not self-indulgent. It's actually much sort of bolder because it's the thing that gets you to do the thing. Uh, it, it's, it's very idealistic and sounds great to be like, okay, I'm going to do these eight things every single day for the rest of my life. But it's meaningless if three days in, you stop doing them. Yeah, it's sort of like New Year's resolutions. And it's funny, the rule of St. Benedict, it's almost like he's the guy who created don't get high in your own supply, right? It'd be <laughs> just like, a, just take a little right. bit, but don't get too, too high on that. Right, yeah. no, absolutely. Um, and the monks were often very, were very often brewing beer, actually. So it was their own supply, yeah. yeah. Wow, good for that. That's awesome. Um, you know, it, it's amazing because the, the human body and mortals that we are, we're so, like... <laughs> We make our lives so so hard because, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking about like my gym routine because years ago I was super into, I was one of these CrossFit idiots. I would go to the gym, eat paleo. I ran a couple marathons. And during this time of my life, it was maybe like five to eight years, I was like, I don't understand why people don't work out. Like, this is good. Why do, why do you not do that? Fast forward a few years, the pandemic comes around. I don't feel like doing anything. And then I'm seeing like people, you know, pelotoning for hours and putting it on their Instagram. And I'm like, why do people got to work out like that? I don't get it. And now I'm <laughs> back on my fitness routine where I, I sort of like your rule of two days. Like I don't go two days without working out. But is there any way to explain us, Oliver? We are so fucking nuts. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it, yeah, you're right. And it's, and it, and what it really adds up to, I think, is the real limits of our willpower or our intellect in making these things work right you have to work with who you are and where you're at in life and you have to sort of go with that and figure out the best thing to do with that rather than have this kind of like here's the plan and i'm going to force it into reality come what may and uh, i want to wrap things up by talking about squeezing it in so uh last week my wife had a minor minor medical procedure and uh it was scheduled for 10 a.m that morning uh at seven o'clock that day the doctor's office calls and they say, hey, listen, can you guys come now? This is three hours before the procedure early in the morning. I'm like, well, we can come now, but we could probably get there by nine o'clock. And they're like, okay, cool. If you're here by 930, it should be fine. Great. So we rush around. My wife's like just got out of the shower. She's running. We get to the office. I take a seat in the waiting room. She goes into the uh, she goes into the, uh, the office and all of a sudden she comes out and she says, the procedure was canceled. I'm like, what do you mean the procedure was canceled? Like, oh, the doctor had to leave. That's why they wanted us to get here earlier. So I, because I'm, the, the stoic in me is like, all right, well, there's nothing I could do about this, but I can, the only thing I can do is like ask why, how did this happen? So I go to the office manager and I say, I totally understand personal things happen, things get in the way, but why on God's green earth did you ask us rush here so then the person would have to leave anyway. The, 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 the person at the desk goes, oh yeah, the doctor tried to squeeze in the procedure before he had to leave. And I use this example of like this idea of us 
trying to squeeze things in. And I think on the top of the list, you don't want to squeeze in, Oliver. And you, you'll probably agree with me on this is squeezing in medical procedures. Let's not let's not do that. <laughs> but this idea of, of of doing it, because I feel like when you're squeezing something in, you're telling someone, I've got two way more important things, but I'm going to try to slot you in in between those important things. Tell me about your thoughts on squeezing things in. <laughs> well, yeah, there is that kind of interpersonal side of it, isn't there? It's kind of rude to be the person who's being squeezed in, and I feel for your, I feel for your experiences. Um, there's also just the general sense in which we we feel that it's a sensible thing to do somehow to try to fit more and more things in to our schedule than we currently have in them, and. Yeah, it's a recipe for disaster because there's always, you're never going to, here's the thing, you're never going to get that doctor. He's never going to get to the point where he feels or he, she feels on top of all the things, right? Squeezing a couple more things in, even if it hadn't inconvenienced you in the way it did, was not going to lead to this wonderful golden plateau of now there's time for everything. And I think that's really the move that I'm focusing on a lot in a lot of my writing is like, okay, what if we just accepted that there was always going to be too much to do? What would we choose to focus on then instead of trying to fit everything in because that's never happening? And this has been a great conversation, Oliver. If folks want to get find out more about helping their time management skills, just becoming better people, uh, where's, the, where's the best introduction to Oliver Berkman? Well, my website, oliverberkman.com, has all the information and my email newsletter. It is... Um, the, the books, especially the recent book, the new book, um, that's the best way to support my work if you're interested in doing so, yeah. Oliver, thanks again for the time. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. I've enjoyed it. And that's going to do it for this episode of Good Listen. Thank you so much for spending some time with me. If you have a moment, I would greatly appreciate it if you hit that thumbs up button. It's a small gesture, but it really helps my channel. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, feel free to leave a five-star review. That'd be nice. I'd dig that. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, and if you want to connect with me, want to find me on social media, want to shoot me a note, uh, just go to joepartavila.com. Thanks again for spending some time with me. I will see you next time. Adios.